16 verses of 2 John and the 14 verses of 3 John, the Apostle warns his readers against having anything to do with false teachers while reminding them to continue loving one another. The common phrase between both letters is walking in truth, and that charge alone needs to be the anthem that we as believers today choose. So as we look into the Word together, let us yearn to become more like our Savior. So my goal is very simple. It is to tell you what God thinks, not tell you what I think. My goal isn't to tell you what you even want to hear. My goal as I labor all week in his word is to tell you what God wants you to hear. And what is lacking is biblical truth and biblical truth matters. In a day and an age where lies and deception are prevalent and it's hard to discern the difference these days. You can't tell whether a news and media outlet are telling you a straightforward truth or if there's an attempt to deceive. So we have to know who we are according to the word of God. So I wanna labor into 2 John verses one through three and it reads as following. The elder, this is the apostle John. This is the disciple John. This is the youngest of the 12. This is the disciple who lived the longest of the 12. He is the disciple that wrote the gospel according to John. He is the disciple that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He also received a revelation from Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation, which is the bookend that tells us, hey, God wins. That is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's not John's revelation. It was Jesus's revelation to John as he penned it in isolation on the Isle of Patmos. This is what he writes to a very small body of believers. And of course, the general application for the Christian today is to understand the difference between truth and lies. Absolute truth, a standard that God has given his church to not only abide in, but to follow, to be obedient to. The elder, to the elect lady and her children, to the congregation in Ephesus, whom I love in truth. That was the basis of last Thursday, love in truth, right? You cannot separate the two. The intersection of love and truth is Jesus Christ. Like the intersection, where they meet. I don't separate the two. I don't struggle with finding out, well, should I lead with truth and maybe come back later with some love? Or should I lead with love and neglect the truth? No, you can't have one without the other according to the Bible. It is biblical love that is merged with biblical truth. That is like the spiritual DNA of every Christian. We don't hesitate to tell the truth, but we always lead with love. And there's never a wrong time nor place to love. Now love sometimes has us telling people near and dear or even strangers far things that are hard to hear because we love them. The love here is about self-sacrificial love, which means I care more about your soul and your eternal destination than your natural comfort. And if I care more about your soul, then I'm willing to tell you the things that the Bible says about the benefits of your soul. He says, love and truth, and not only I, now this is where I got my thoughts from last week, but also all those who know the truth. Right, so here's the common denominator for all of us in this room. If you've made Jesus your Lord and Savior, then you can look around and call brothers and sisters in Christ your family. You are God's child based on receiving Jesus. You are covered by the blood of Christ. That's the common denominator. You were once a sinner and now you choose Jesus as your savior. See, what binds Christians together is not social, not political, and not racial compatibility. In fact, when you lead with those, they divide. What binds Christians together is spiritual compatibility. Sinners saved by grace, and that grace has a name. It's Jesus Christ. That is why I can look out at anyone, regardless of their skin color, and see them as a brother or sister in Christ, as part of God's family. John is saying that is the common denominator. Why? Because of the truth, which abides in us, lives in us, and it will be with us forever. Verse three, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. This is the salutation before the body of the letter. Verse one, the elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. Definition of love in truth. Love, of course, is agape, or some say agape. It's self-sacrificial love. It's God's love. It's the very love that Jesus lived out when he went to that cross. He laid aside his rights and he followed his father's will and he gave me his life. That's the type of love here. Truth, doctrinal truth, biblical truth, truth in practice, 
Truth as you experience from the word, but truth that has a name, it's Jesus. Jesus said the same word defined the same way, I am the way, the truth. John is saying love in Christ, but it also has a unique definition that we need to start with. It is the word reality. Actuality, reality, this word reality is the definition of truth. And John says, but also all those who know the truth. Know what? Know reality. Where does reality come from? It comes from God. Let me define it like this. Truth is that which is consistent with reality. Then what's reality? Reality is that which is consistent with God's authority. Let me say that one more time, then I'm moving very fast. Truth is consistent with reality and reality is consistent with God's authority. If anyone does not submit to God's authority, they are detached from reality. If they're not submitted to truth, they are irrational. They are impractical. They are senseless. The word is unrealistic. You ever heard of perspective? And you go, that's an unrealistic perspective. It's because they're not attached to the truth. So they can't see the world we live in from a spiritual reality. And what is lacking today from all of these unbiblical narrative is reality, a reality. For example, and I thought this would go away over time, but it hasn't. In fact, the media is not talking about it. In fact, they're pumping the vein of this unrealistic perspective by not talking about it. It's almost as if they're supporting it. It is this idea behind defunding the police. Why is he talking about that? That's a political issue. No, it's not a political issue. It's a biblical issue because God has given us law and order as a restraint to keep evil back. And anyone that wants to push aside law and order stands for anarchy. And you need a biblical perspective to see and discern it. Defund the police? Not defund Planned Parenthood. Not defund Pizzagate. To fund the police. And their experiment was in Seattle. You probably didn't see it because the media didn't want to show it. It was a, a group of protesters in the name of peaceful protesting taking over six city blocks in Seattle, renaming it and calling it CHAZ, the CHAZ, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. In the name of peace, and policing ourselves, I don't know if you were planning your next vacation, but the country of Chaz only lasted 24 days, so I would encourage you to reconsider where you're going for your vacation. They are no longer open because the mayor who once said, it is just peaceful protesters who are, they're gonna have their summer of love. Well, let me tell you about 24 days of a people taking over six city blocks in the name of lawlessness. There were two murders, there were four homicides, there were sexual assaults, there were rapes, and the police couldn't get to the people who lived there to police it because they had shut it down. It was a hostile takeover. It is lawlessness. And if you see any of the news footage from all of the chaos in our country, if you take a snapshot at the majority of the individuals that are participating in a lawless manner, you will see a certain demographic of our society. And by and large, it is those who are under the age of 40. And many of them that are arrested and their profile is put on the news for either lighting a business on fire or committing a crime, they're millennials, and their profile tells you that they're college graduates, and they went to these prestigious schools. And I go, why is it the certain demographic are these millennials? And I'm a millennial, I said this last time. I want you to understand, it's because for decades, the campuses and the colleges and the universities are actually indoctrinating the youth. If you wanna get a hold of the land, you get a hold of the youth. It's brainwashing at its finest. It's socialist agenda, it's godless. And I'm saying, if you're a millennial in here and you go to a college campus, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth and you can't bow down to a culture. You gotta bow down to your savior. See, there's a pattern here. You don't have to look far in history. In fact, you only have to go back to the 60s. And you can even go to a communist country, the People's Republic of China, after Mao Zedong took over with a civil war. 
Eventually, he kind of fell back into the, the shadows of the governing bodies. There were people making decisions over those next several decades into the 60s. Mao did not like what he saw. You know what happened in the land of the People's Republic of China? Capitalism began to reign. Capitalism and free enterprise, and their economy began to boom. And Mao didn't like that. He wanted to go back to a socialist and a communism way. So you know what he did? He employed the youth. And you know who he used? News and media, propaganda, and publicity. And if you Google it and you research the Red Guard, it was the youth that went around reaping terror on people. You know what they did? They defaced property. They tried to erase the history, tearing down statues. They tried to revise their history there. I say that to say this. I'm not talking about having faith in America. I'm bringing all that up because America allows us to have our faith. And it is our faith in Jesus Christ that has made this country we live in bold and beautiful. And the moment we're departing from those biblical standards and Christians everywhere are sitting on the sidelines of lies instead of standing on truth. And we're watching a complete erosion, corruption. I said it before, I'm gonna say it again. It is progressive thought that is produced from a degenerate heart, that's an unsaved heart, that produces ungodly onslaught. Progressivism is a departure from God in the name of humanism. And you can't see it unless you have spiritual eyes. First Corinthians chapter two is where I wanna stay for a moment. First Corinthians chapter two tells us what type of eyes we need to see. It begins in verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man, the, the ungenerated man, does not see, nor does he receive the things of God. The natural man here is the word suke. It's where we get the word psychology. It's where we get the word soul. A psychologist dissects the soul, studies the soul. The natural man here is dead in spirit, which means he can only live off of his soul. Your soul is your inward animating essence. It's your personality, it's your will, it's your emotion, it's your intellect, it's where you make your decisions from. So if you don't have a spiritual compass, you're making it from a soulish position and a soulish position only can have two different capacities. One's emotional and feelings aren't always fact. So you're seeing people make decisions based on how I feel, what's right for me, my truth. The other way we make decisions as a natural man or woman without Christ is by intellect. It's what I know from birth to death. That is the capacity by which you're seeing natural men and natural women make decisions. They have no regard for spiritual things, no regard for eternity. So you can't make an actual decision that benefits your spirit, if your spirit's dead. Paul writes again to the church, the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Can't know them. Why am I starting here? Why am I priming the pump here? Because if you don't know truth, you will not have the ability spiritually to discern a lie. And I'm seeing people who call themselves Christians that are being led astray by lies and deception. Why? Because they're not feeding their spirit. They don't have a spiritual mind to see the world we live in because they don't spend time connected to the vine. But the spiritual man, verse 15, he judges all things. Wait, I thought we weren't supposed to judge. No, no, the Bible says the spiritual man, the Christian makes judgments. The spiritual man, the Christian, is the only one that can make proper, ethical, and moral judgments. The spiritual man is the only one that understands the actual divine design around life, marriage, sexuality, identity, and the list goes on. The spiritual man is the only one that has the pulse on the way life is unfolding because he sees it from a spiritual lens. Anybody with a natural mind has the lens of a lie over their eyes, and that's how the enemy wants it. But the spiritual man judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. What does that mean? Does that mean people can't judge us as Christians? No, they can judge our flaws, our failures, 
our faults, but they'll never be able to properly judge our faith. There's a reason why when you stand up for truth, instead of going with the masses and the majority or going with the current of the culture, when you stand up for truth and you're not willing to go to that college party, you're not willing to drink yourself to an oblivion, you're not willing to sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend pre-marriage, you're not willing to live with them before marriage and all of that, your friends with a natural mind, they don't have a safe spirit, they're gonna judge you for it, but they're gonna judge you wrong. What you're making is a decision that is gonna benefit your spirituality and your eternity. They judge us wrong. But I gotta expect what's coming when I stand for truth. Because the further any given society drifts away from the truth, guys, the more they're gonna absolutely hate those that speak it. And this is what's causing many Christians to go, you know what? I don't wanna offend anybody. I don't wanna actually tell it how it is because I don't want them to hate me. I want them to like me. Isn't that what our human nature, my natural mind wants you to like me. Before I come out here on stage, my prayer is, Lord, let me say what you want me to say, not what I wanna say. I would turn this into a popularity contest and I would want you to like me. He's a good speaker, but guess what? I gotta stand before God one day for how I administered his word and I wanna be with a clean conscience saying, Lord, I told them all you said in your word and I left nothing for interpretation. See, as Christians, when you speak the truth, you are to expect hate from the world, but not for being weird, but for being about the word. Huge difference. I know a lot of people that are persecuted and opposed and hated on for being weird. Listen to me, if you have a non-believing friend and you take them to church, what you don't wanna do in front of them is to begin speaking in tongues. Listen, they have a hard time understanding the gospel in English. The last thing they're going to want to understand is the gospel according to tongues. I'm not talking about being persecuted and hated for being weird. I'm talking about being persecuted and hated for being about the word. Recently, unbiblical shenanigans entered God's house, his church, a very popular church in California. You can Google it. You can Google search California church and the Lord of Rings. And they had prominent leaders on stage, very influential Christian leaders on stage. And it was a woman, she called herself a prophetess. And she basically said that God gave her a prophetic vision. Okay, I'm tracking with you. And then she began to talk about the Lord of Rings and how the scene in the Lord of Rings that involved Gandalf and Gandalf was confronting a demon on the bridge and he had this giant staff and he was confronting the demon and he would slam the staff on the ground and he would yell, thou shalt not pass. Well, this is her explaining what they were gonna to do to combat the demon of racism. And she literally had them hold this staff on stage, banging it on the ground as they chanted, thou shalt not pass. And all the comments on YouTube, people of course are attacking it and other people are defending it, saying stop judging. And I'm saying, stop judging. The spiritual man judges accurately and rightly. People are saying, don't make fun of that, that's symbolism. I go, no, that's mysticism. That has no place in the body of Christ. I don't need to get up here with a staff and bang it on the ground and chant a line from a movie. I need to call people back to the cross and repentance. That's what eradicates racism. Don't write me a letter trying to convince me that what they did was symbology and based on apostolic authority. No, I don't need to hear that. I know my Bible, I read it. I wanna know what God has to say about combating any form of sin. See, if the world hates you, Jesus said, you know that it hated me before it hated you. What did they hate about Christ? I'll tell you, his message. His message was repentance. The very first ministering he did was repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, I'm here. I'm gonna pay for your sin, but you must turn away from your sin and you must come to me because I am, they didn't like this. I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. No one can get to my father unless they come through me, that's offensive to a world and a culture that says there are many ways to get to God. You do you, you be a good person, your good morals will get you saved. I was baptized as a babe. And all of that is the lies of the enemy 
that are literally deceiving and blinding minds. And we're waiting for ministers and pastors of the word to stand behind the pulpit with the fire of God, calling people back to the only power that could save the soul. And it's the gospel according to Jesus Christ. See, it's not a one and done deal. Paul wrote to Timothy because he experienced the same persecution. Paul was calling people out for their sin. In a world that we live in today, oh, that's, that's unloving. But the most loving thing one could do is tell somebody about their eternal consequence. It's the most loving thing you could do is to tell somebody about their eternal consequence apart from Christ. Paul would write to Timothy, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Like absolutely mandatory, yes. All who desire to live godly like God will suffer mandatory persecution. It is to be expected. Now this is what turns people off, easy believism. I just wanna go on my way. I wanna stay out of other people's way. I wanna stay in my lane. I wanna allow other people to live in a, such a manner that is ungodly, but not even flinch to it. In fact, we even go as far as blinking at sin. We blink at it. We wink at it. It's acceptable. Jesus would say again, out of the kingdom constitution, this is what we call the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes begin in chapter five. He ends the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount of this section by saying, blessed are those. Blessed means manifestly happy. Blessed are those who are persecuted, ready? For righteousness sake, not for weirdness sake, for righteousness sake, for right character, right conduct, right conversation in Christ. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when they revile, insult, and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for my sake. Jesus said, for, for my sake, when you stand for me, oh, you can expect the emails, oh, you can expect the letters, Oh, you can expect the pushback on Facebook when you post that video that goes against other people's ideology. You can expect it because they don't want to be confronted by the truth because the truth, the truth is an accountability. And I don't want to be accountable because I want to live in my flesh. Jesus said this, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Like this is the opposite of what happens when I get persecuted or when somebody hates on me for being a Christian. I don't rejoice. I'm not glad about that. What is Jesus doing here? He's asking us to elevate our perspective. He says, hey, remember the prophets? They were persecuted too. They stood for righteousness. They were my mouthpiece with my message. You are amongst the class of the prophets when you are persecuted for your faith. You know what verse 14 is? Verse 13 and 14 are in Matthew 5? You are the salt of the earth. Jesus goes into this what we call similitudes. It's a comparison of things that are like salt and light, but I wanna stop at salt because salt to me is remarkable. Salt had a unique quality to it, especially in Jesus' time. Salt was not only used for preservation, it was a healing agent, it was medicinal. If you had a cut, they would pack it with salt. Sometimes that salt would irritate the wound, but it was good for the wound. The salt was also used to add flavor. Any of us know when we add salt to our meals, bland meals, bitter meals, when you add salt, it adds Flavor, one thing you have to know about salt, salt in and of itself is enough to influence what it touches. Salt does not become like that which it touches. It doesn't use the world's tactics to influence the world. We're seeing Christians who are becoming like the world to try to reach the world. And Jesus is like, no, you are the salt of the earth. Just interact with the people with truth and love and they'll see me in you. Because the culture's decaying, right? They would pack fishes and meats with salt to preserve them because they didn't have refrigeration. They couldn't go down to Wawa and grab packs of ice. So they use salt. And Jesus is saying the day you live in, the day that we live in is decaying at a faster rate than ever before. You know why? Because the church is not in its rightful place as the salt of the earth, as the preservative, as the righteousness of God that is preserving the culture from decaying. Moms and dads, you are the salt of your children's phones. You are the preservative. You don't let decay come through that mobile or that medium, which is influencing their souls and it's leading them astray. You are the spiritual protector of your home. 
You are the salt of the earth. Jesus says if the salt loses its flavor, saltiness, it's good for nothing but to be thrown out underfoot and be trampled on by men. How does salt lose its flavor? Do you ever ask yourself that? One way. It'd be leached out. What do I mean by leached out? They would add other ingredients to the pure salt. To make more salt, they would add ingredients that would compromise the quality of the salt. They would actually dilute the salt. Dilution. And that's what happens when the church mixes it up with the world. Again, we take the world's methods, the world's tactics, and we bring them into the church as a way to reach lost people. No, salt needs to maintain its integrity. And that's why dilution in a Christian is solely the result of lacking devotion. You feel diluted lately? Can I tell you why? It's because we lack devotion to the word. We're not spending enough time in the word of God. We are not committing our hearts and our souls to the one who created them. We are not giving him room in our lives to begin to minister to us. We are spending more time understanding, memorizing, and learning the narrative from MSNBC as opposed to the B-I-B-L-E. And that's why I'm convinced people that go by the name Christian are posting things that are contrary to the word of God. It's because they're getting their narrative and they're being fed by the liberal media as opposed to the word of God. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Now, he's saying this. He's not saying, if you spend time in my word, you are automatically my disciple. He's saying, if you're my disciple, you'll want to spend time in my word. If you're my student, you'll want to spend time in my word. And my word will make you free. You'll know the truth. Like, you will know the absolute truth. You'll know the standard of God. You'll have a biblical worldview. You'll have God's eyes for this world. You will stand on the truth and nothing can push you off of it. You will know it and it will set you free. Remember, it's the same word that I defined earlier. Truth is that which is consistent with reality and reality is that which is consistent with God's authority. You will know reality. You will know liberty. You will be set free from sinfulness. You will be set free from worldliness. You will be set free from political correctness. You will be set free from unbiblical narratives. You will know Jesus and Jesus will set you free. Your identity will be Christ. Nothing else. Soak your mind in the word, it shapes your life. Psalm 119, 11 says, hide God's word in your heart that you might not sin. I, I fear the church has lost the art of memorization. If we could just get back to memorizing God's word, memorizing verses, spending time soaking in the word of God so that it takes over my mind, my stinking thinking. The word hide is the word treasure. Treasure God's word in your heart. Any of us actually treasure and value God's word? You know what that word meant in biblical times? It is what they did when they had valuables, when they had possessions, when they had anything that had monetary value. They didn't go to the bank because there was no such thing as a bank. No safety deposit boxes. All they had was their yard. So they would go in their yard and they would find a secure space that only they knew about and they would dig a hole and they would put that valuable in the hole and they would bury it. That is the word treasure, hide. Hide God's word in your heart. Only you can do that. Protect it in your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart. Guard your heart above everything else. Above everything else that you are currently working on on your priority list, where is guarding your heart on that list? Where is guarding your soul from ungodly influences? And I'll go first. I find myself scrolling through social media too much. You know how that goes. One page takes you to another page. You get so far down that rabbit hole, you don't even know the person that you're stalking. But you're watching the TikTok video and you're like, man, and 
Two hours have gone by. And I'm saying, imagine if you had just applied 20 minutes of that two hours to memorizing scripture or putting on worship music and just worshiping or praying and saying, God, I don't have the answer for this broke down, fractured world, but you do. Give me your peace. Give me your power. Give me your purpose. Give me your plan so I can walk out into this world and make a godly difference. I've said this illustration before, I absolutely love it because I pictured in my mind a giant city with its looming, booming walls, impenetrable walls. Picture any city you want, big walls that would protect the entire city, would, would protect all the people of the city. But there was one place that the whole city's integrity could be lost. It was the gate, just the gate. It, it depended on the gatekeeper. And all he did was protect the gate. And by protecting the gate, he protected the whole city. What are you saying? I'm saying when you protect the truth, you're allowing the truth to protect you. When they protected the gate, he was allowing the entire gate to protect the people. When we protect the truth and nothing can steal it, we're allowing it to protect our minds, protect our souls. Because John says that's the common denominator because of the truth, verse 2, which abides in us. The word is live, the word is settle in, the word is continue in. It's not a one and done thing, it's something that is active, it's moving. The word abide is what you do when you go to your home and you stay there, you live there, you're active there. The word abide is what Jesus said to his disciples about himself. He said in John chapter 15, verse five, that entire chapter is remarkable, but he said in verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit, spiritual fruit. And I don't have time to talk about the spiritual fruit, but you won't bear fruit if you're not connected to the vine. You won't bear love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. You won't have that in your life because you're not spending time with the vine. But what he said next is, apart from me, you can do nothing. The audacity of Jesus to say that. Oh, you might look good in your career, might make a lot of money, you might be popular amongst your peers, but if you're not connected to me, it means nothing. You'll be the richest person in the graveyard. Notice earlier I talked about reality because that's what the word truth means. Apart from the vine, apart from truth, detached from the vine, detached from truth, unrealistic perspectives living in a world that isn't aligned with God's word. So how do we know if we're attached to the truth? How do we know if the truth abides in us? How do you know if the truth lives in you right now? Truth recognized, truth number one. Let me change analogies though. I love the heat, love the sun, spend most of my time outside when it's hot. I love it, it can't get hot enough. I cut my grass the other day. As I was about to cut my grass, my wife came outside and says, why are you choosing today to do lawn work. It's one of the hottest days. And I was like, exactly. So I love it. But I don't have to talk about that. When I get up on stage, you'll notice something. You'll notice he's been in the sun. And you can tell if somebody's been in the sun, S-U-N, by their complexion. You could tell whether they've been in the sun if they're sunburnt or they're sun tanned. They don't have to talk about it. When they walk up on you, you go, you've been in the sun. And the same truth applies spiritually. If you can tell I've been in the sun physically, I could tell if you've been in the sun spiritually, not by complexion, but by reflection, by transformation. You could tell when somebody spends time in the word, it saturates their mind, it comes off their tongue, they speak truth, they speak life, they speak words words that are provided by the Holy Spirit. John said in the first epistle, chapter two, verse three, now by this, we know that we know him. I like the riddle there. I like, like the, the way he puts his words together in the Greek. Now by this, we know that we know him. And I always stop and go, wait, how do I know that I know him? John completes the sentence. If you keep his commandments, if you follow his truth. Now by this, we know that we know Christ. We spend time in his word. Verse six in that same chapter, 1 John chapter two, verse six. He who says he abides, same word, in Christ. He who says he's connected to Jesus, ought, that's a financial term, ought himself also walk as Jesus walked. What do you mean ought? Financial term. 
if the gospel weighs anything in your life, your life will live worthy of the gospel. If the gospel has any bearing, any weight on your lives, young ones in here, look at me. I know mom and dad raised you to come to church, but you gotta make a decision to come to Christ. It's your faith. You have to make a decision to give Jesus your life. This is no longer mom and dad's thing. You come to Christ and Christ enters your life and you're no longer concerned about what people think. No longer care about what the pop culture's doing. You go, you go and walk like Christ walked. You begin to walk, it's what John says, ought. There is a moral and a financial obligation, but you can't pay this debt back. Like that's the beauty of this thing. When Christ went to the cross and anyone comes and says, that person right there owes you, Father, for their life's sin. And Jesus will step out and say, oh, they owe nothing. I paid for everything your past sin, your present sin, and even the sins you have not fell into yet, Christ already died for, set you free from. So truth isn't just informative. Truth is also transformative, right? You can't be about the truth if your life doesn't change. Truth changes us. Truth isn't just facts in us. I know a lot of people who have very big brains but very small hearts. They know a lot of stuff. They retain a lot of information. They are very intellectual, smartest people I know, compared to having an inch away from the scripture, yet their life is a mile away from the Savior. Truth acts on us, not just facts in us. Truth changes us from the inside out. I love what Ezra Taft Benson said. I quoted him last Thursday. I wanna take the beginning of what he quoted. He said, the world works from the outside in. The Lord works from the inside out. The world would take people out of the slums. Jesus takes the slums out of people who then take themselves out of the slums. See, knowledge that doesn't change our soul, church, is useless. D.L. Moody, famous American evangelist said, the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. Any movement, any organization, any minister, any church, any individual Christian, any politician, you fill in the blank. Anyone calling for change without the word of God leading the charge is vain and void. Let me say that again. Anyone calling for change without the word of God leading the charge is vain, is void, will not accomplish lasting change. See, truth isn't just transformative. We got that far. Truth is also transcendent. That's a big word. It means superior, can mean supernatural, preeminent. When I say this word transcendent, God is transcendent, it's like he's unreachable. But we know that in Emmanuel, in Jesus, God with us, he became reachable. So this word transcendent is that God doesn't change. God has a set standard, a set way. His justice does not change. His love does not change. His mercy does not change. His truth does not change. His equity does not change. His sovereignty does not change, which means when I know truth is transcendent, my God is transcendent, it doesn't leave me in a place of uncertainty. It gives me confidence in his sovereignty. Look at me carefully. God will have the final say on everything from the rising and the falling of kingdoms, empires, presidents, God will have the final say. Nothing is outside his sovereignty. Why are Christians and churches panicking when our God is in complete control over everything? Amen. But remember, I wanna reiterate something when I know that and I say, yeah, God's will be done. Saying God's will be done does not forsake nor negate me from doing God's will. So I still do my part. I partner with God's sovereignty. That's my human and Christian responsibility. I labor in prayer to discover God's will for my life. I don't sit off on the sideline and go, God's got it. He does, but he sent Jesus to 
interact with humanity to show us the way he wants us to. Truth is transcendent. It's the fact that John said, ready? The truth lives in us, it abides in us, verse two, and will be with us forever. Truth doesn't change. God's going to be with the same God that was with Elijah, the same God that was with Esther, same God that was with Moses, same God that was with David, same God that gave Solomon wisdom, same God that was with Ruth, same God that was with Daniel, the same God that was with the prophets, the same God that was with Peter and James and John, the same God that chose Judas and knew he would betray him, the same God that was with them is with us. His Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth indwells the bodies of his people. God lives in you. God lives in you. I'm pounding this into your heart. God, the creator of the universe, lives inside of you. Men, God lives in you. Yeah. See, that's the tie that binds. Time after time, truth. Historically, from eternity, the tie that binds us together is the truth. I'm gonna read some, some verses here. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus' words, his will, his way, will by no means pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. Everything you see with your eyes, this natural world will pass away. It is failing, it is fallen, it will pass away. But one thing that will remain, the word of the Lord. That is why I am confident through the study of God's word, from understanding his heart, trying to put my spiritual finger on his pulse, I can come to the conclusion biblically with sound doctrine, standing on truth and love and say this with a clear conscience, God, God is not trying to fix the broken systems of the world. God's desire is to fix the broken souls of the world. Huge difference. It's what social justice does not understand. Can't fix a broken world with a broken solution. You fix broken souls with the power of the gospel. Bible verse, 1 John 2, 17, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And finally, the crescendo, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, since you have purified your souls, right? This kind of series of verses ties together everything we've covered tonight. Listen to the words, the word of the Lord reads, since you have purified your souls, suke, in obeying the truth through the spirit, in sincere love of each other, love one another fervently. Let it burn. Let it heat up from a pure heart. Verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, its flowers will fade and fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of God will walk into eternity and you need to know God's word. Verse 25, now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Peter's like, I want to remind you everything I just laid before you that the world you live in is fading away like the grass, like the flowers, but the word of God in you, the word of God through you will endure. When you abide in the word and the word is in you, you will endure. You will walk into eternity with confidence, with the peace of God. And it's the gospel that changes lives. That is why verse three, the salutation is the primer to the pump for every Christian everywhere. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father, from the 
the Lord Jesus, the son of the father. In case you're mistaken who Jesus is, Jesus was the son of the father. He was God made flesh. And the reason why we need to understand truth and love is because apart from God's truth and love as laid out tonight, we can never have God's grace, God's mercy and God's peace. And I'm telling you the church today needs God's grace needs God's mercy and needs God's peace. Not something you experienced 10 years ago when you first gave your life to the Lord, yet you've run dry, you've become diluted by the world, you've lost the understanding of grace. Grace is defined as God giving you what you don't deserve. You didn't deserve the gift. Mercy is defined as God keeping you from what you do deserve. You deserve death. The wages of sin Well, I'm just a liar. Jesus says just a liar is on the same playing field as a murderer. The wages of sin is death. And God gave you mercy. He kept us from what we deserve. Well, how did he do that? Because he gave us Jesus, which is what we didn't deserve. Because of his grace, I can receive his mercy. And when I have a knowledge of his grace and his mercy, I will have peace. Not only peace with God, I will be at peace with God and for God. See, there are certain situations where people are born into an inheritance. We call it a birthright, right? You could take any royal family. That child was born into royalty. They had not contributed anything to the family. They brought nothing into the world, but by birth, they had a right to the kingdom. And I'm saying, when you're born again, you brought nothing to the table. You brought nothing but your sin. And Jesus said, I'll take the sin and I'll make you righteous because I'm giving you grace, unmerited favor, and I'm giving you mercy. It's new every morning. Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. It's a grace sandwich. He said, I am who I am by God's grace. God made me who I am, my calling, and I'm gonna labor more abundantly than all my peers, all my colleagues, every minister in the area. I'm gonna spend time in the word, in prayer. I'm gonna labor and I'm gonna tell you about it because when I tell you about it, I'm gonna say, yet not I, but the grace of God, which is working in me, which is always for me. And when I have a handle on grace and mercy, I can step into God's peace. Romans chapter five, verse one, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. It's reconciliation. It's an exchange from a life that was at odds against God, rebellious and at war to a life that is at peace. And when you're at peace with God, you then spend time with the Prince of Peace in his word and you get the peace of God. And I'm telling you, more than any evangelistic message verbally, it is the peace of God that people need to see on your life visually. You wanna lead people to Christ, let them see you at peace in the midst of a world at chaos. Stop complaining, stop fretting, and go in with a smile and talk about how God is good in the midst of circumstances that aren't seemingly good. And that will be the hook, the line, and the sinker because people are gonna go, how are you smiling? How are you happy? How are you joyful in the midst of sorrow? How do you have peace when everything around us is crumbling? And you're able to say, oh, it's not of me. It's of God. Thanks, mom. I'm up here sweating for you guys. <laughs> all right, let's wrap this up, man. Let's wrap this up. I can go all night. Whew. So, where do you go from here? You remind yourself that the, the bind, the tie, that holds this thing together is Christ. In him, we consist. He holds it all together. So I wanna step back into that pattern of living, getting back into the word, letting the word get into me, taking over every space in my mind and my heart, and then waking up tomorrow to new mercies and living in light of eternity. That is what's gonna change our society. And until God returns, let us be about his business. Because since we're not dead, We're not done. We've heard it by God's grace. Let's do it. Let me pray. Father, these are yours. Your word has been presented tonight. I pray your Holy Spirit begins to seal it upon hearts. 
that you would give us an appetite to pursue your will, your righteousness. Father, thank you for being the salt of the earth, showing us by example that we can influence the world around us. Give us Holy Spirit power as we depart. Be with your people, marriages, families, and all in this room under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.